D, Converted Man here. So we got two people that answered the questions that we had in the picture project. I'm going to go ahead and read off Danny Lee's answers to these in this video. And I may or may not deal with the other gentleman that answered these questions in a different video. I'm going to list all the answers that he gave in the description box below so that you can make your own video about it if you want to. But I'm going to just read off his answers to these questions as you see the questions that we asked on the screen. All right, here we go. Okay, so he said no to this one. So that's that's a good thing, I think, that he doesn't automatically think that an argument against evolution is an argument for creationism. So that's a good start. He said that he never heard of Pascal's wager. And he said there's, there's only one God and you just have to believe in that God to be saved. The problem is there's 10,000 plus gods to choose from in this world. So how do you make that selection? What's the process that you go through to make that selection? Do you just go eeny, meeny, miny, mo? I mean, what is the process to get you to the one particular god to choose from all these different gods? For this one, he just said that he didn't know how many times that this has happened. I don't really have any comment on that answer. The answer he gave to this is the Bible. He says that the Bible says that there's only one God that happens to be his God. He feels that the Bible matches reality from evidence such as intelligent design due to the, the logicality of God's plan. I don't think that he's ever looked at any other religious textbooks because they also have similar patterns that you could get the same answer from. But this is circular argumentation and is a reason to not have this answer as an actual answer. All right, now to demonstrate why circular argumentation isn't a good way to answer things. I would like to ask this person if he believes what's on the screen right now. Does he believe that God wrote that on the screen? He probably will say no, and he might even want to reference the Bible. I would encourage him to not reference the Bible and to stick with me here for a moment. God did not write this on the screen. How do you know that God didn't write it on the screen? The screen says that God wrote it, and God said that it was God that wrote it on the screen. So how do you know God didn't write it on the screen? Don't turn to your Bible. Just answer the question. How do you know it wasn't God? Okay, so you can't tell me in one breath, I know that's not God. I know that you wrote that. And then in the next breath say, but I know God wrote the Bible. You can't do that because the logic is identical. You don't know that God wrote and or inspired anything that the Bible says in it, period. You believe that is true. Just like someone could believe that the words on the screen were really written by God when in fact they were not. Humans can lie. They can make up stories. How do you know that the Bible isn't a made up story? That is something that your answer does not explain. You used circular argumentation. You said that the Bible said it was true, therefore it's true. Well, the words on the screen say that they're true, therefore they're true. If you reject one, you should reject the other. He says in response to this one that he has a very weak experiment. And he says that spontaneous generation has been experimented repeatedly for ages, but there's never been a success. That's not evidence for creationism, nor does it refute evolution. What you're thinking of, maybe, is a biogenesis. But spontaneous generation is not how we think a biogenesis occurred anymore. We used to think that that was a possibility. Thanks to all of those experiments that you mentioned, we no longer believe that spontaneous generation is how abiogenesis occurred. Abiogenesis is a separate thing independent from biological evolution. It is its own category. It's easy to confuse the two because they're right next to each other, but it's its own field of study. It's its own 
hypothetical realm where people are coming up with hypotheses and they're trying to test them and they're trying to make them into theories. Okay, there's multiple explanations right now of abiogenesis. One of the ones that I like, but I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know if it's the right one. I do know that the facts align well with it, is that the building blocks of life that require are required for life to begin, the, the, the littlest bits of those blocks of life have been found in meteorites. So it's not impossible to posit that a number of meteorites struck the Earth very early on and when they fragmented those building blocks of life got together. They happened to roll into each other, whether it be in the ocean or on land or a combination thereof, who knows. But nonetheless, they somehow got together eventually, and that produced life. That might not be the actual explanation, but it is a potential explanation. And that would be a explanation possibly for abiogenesis, but it would have nothing to do with evolution or creationism at all. He says in response to this one that he can't answer the question because he disagrees with the fact that there are artifacts that are 40,000 years old. He doesn't agree that the artifacts exist, and he believes that the dating methods used on such artifacts are not accurate. That last part, I think, is key for this gentleman to really think about. You believe that this is inaccurate. Do you know that it's inaccurate? What understanding do you have about the dating methods utilized? Have you studied the dating methods at all? Have you seen the predictions that they can make? Have you seen that those predictions have come true? If you don't know anything about this at all, and you're just basing it on your own beliefs, that's called an appeal to ignorance. And you need to read up on this material. Getting a number of books and or researching online. And if you're going to do the research online, stay away from the creationist sites because they will lead you in the wrong direction, I guarantee you. Stick to the scientific websites. I'm not going to give you any atheist websites. I'm saying go to the scientific websites. They will explain this, hopefully, in ways that you can understand. And it might be something that is really hard to understand, but it is something that you should strive to understand. I myself won't be able to explain it to you. My field is logic, not this branch of science. I know very little about general science, but I, I can't explain to you this scientifically. Perhaps one of the other atheist YouTubers, skeptical YouTubers out there might be able to explain the science behind this. I can't. But I would encourage you to do the research and to make this not a belief anymore. To not rest your ideas on beliefs, but rest them on facts. His response to this is that he doesn't know, but his guess would be that because creationism requires belief in God, modern science rejects its validity as real science. <sighs> Again, you're guessing the answers rather than trying to find the real answers. You're basing your uh, answers on your beliefs and your guesses rather than looking for the actual information and doing the research. I know that it's time consuming, but learn something new, okay? There are scientists that believe in God. I hope that you're aware of this, okay? There are plenty of scientists that believe in God. There are even scientists that believe in God who reject what is called creationism, which is one or more of the following ideas I've already talk to you a little bit about this. Creationism is a belief that biological evolution is not true and or a belief that the world is younger than 4.54 billion years old and or you can also add that maybe geocentricism which is the idea that the earth is in the center of the universe. 
any of those things qualifies you as a creationist, at least from my perspective and my point of view. Somebody else might have a slightly different definition of creationist. So, if you are in line with science, then you're no longer a creationist from my point of view. If you agree with science, then you're a theist, and I would not have these problems that I do with you now. I'd have other problems with you, to be sure, but it wouldn't be these problems. It would be one less thing that creates a potential stumbling block for me to come to your particular theology, which is something that your theology says don't create stumbling blocks, right? So, instead of just saying, well, the Earth is 6,000 years old, or biological evolution didn't happen, and basing these statements on nothing more than your guesswork and or your faith and or your dogma, why not investigate the science and find out if these things are true? What you'll find out is these things are true. The reason that creationism is rejected is not because it has something to do with God, although that's a part of it, and I'll get to that in a bit, but because none of the ideas posited by creationists can be tested. They can make no predictions. They can produce no results. So that's not science. As far as God not being in the equation, you won't find God in science, not because there aren't people who believe in God that are scientists, but because God, whatever it is or is not, is not something we can study right now. Maybe we lack the technology to do that. Or maybe God is so well hidden that we won't find it. Or maybe God is in a different dimension that we'll never be able to access. Or whatever explanation you want to posit. Regardless, until God becomes something that we can test, God will never be something that will be a thing that is in the sciences. So, you can believe in God and be a scientist, but if you wanted to test God, you would have to construct some sort of machine to test God. And if that machine failed, then the result is what? Either God doesn't exist or you're unable to test God. So, then you have to try again and again and again. When we have tested prayer we have found the result to be exactly what we would think that nature would produce. The same results, or sometimes even worse, than what nature would produce on its own. So prayer has been labeled as something that we just can't test by many theists and skeptics. You could also draw the conclusion that Prayer is untestable because God doesn't want to be tested, and God knows that we're testing it. So whenever we start to test God using prayer, he shuts off the answers for that prayers and leaves it up to chance. Which means, again, that God is identical with nature, so there's no way to test God, and we're done with that particular test. So we can't use prayer to verify God. That's one more thing that we can't use to verify if it's there. I don't know why God wouldn't allow us to test it, but nonetheless, that's why you'll never find God in science. Not because science is anti-God, but because God is not something that is testable by science. Either because it doesn't want to be, or because it doesn't exist. I decide the latter, you decide perhaps the former. Okay, the answer he provides here is the Bible says God's a spirit. I believe he created the physical realm, which includes the physical space. Apart from God, there is nothing. He does not need space. He is self-sufficient. I probably would agree with you that the Bible does say that God's a spirit, but I don't know that it says any of the other things that you're claiming here about God. These seem to be things that you think are true. But I don't think that the Bible really clarifies where God is located other than a vague definition of heaven, which still would be somewhere, I think. I, I don't really know. But again, this is an appeal to 
circular argumentation. You have not yet proven that the Bible is something that we should think is true versus thinking that it's just made up by people that didn't know any better, that just thought that there was a God and they were just wrong. They just made up stories that sounded nice, and they told each other these stories, and they started to believe in these stories, and other people believed in them. You know, uh, we see this all the time in our modern-day society. I mean, not going that far back, you've got Mormons. We know how the Mormons started. If you want to go more modern than that, we've got the uh, Scientology movement. That's some pretty crazy stuff, but people will believe in it. People can believe in all sorts of crazy stuff, but that doesn't make that crazy stuff true. What they lack is a way to prove that that stuff is true. And you're lacking a way to prove that any of this is true. I, I understand that you believe that it's true, and I understand that you believe that it's a spirit, and that a spirit wouldn't obey the rules of a physical thing, maybe. But it doesn't go far enough to really give us an answer in the way that I would want an answer to be given to us, if you understand what I'm saying, okay? Moving on. Okay, he gives us a rather long answer for this one, which is fine. I'm fine with long answers. If everyone forgot religion, there wouldn't be any new regenerated saved Christians. The Christian spirits who were regenerated but forgot religion too to this case would... Although the mind not be renewed, his spirit would remain regenerated, allowing him to enter heaven after death. What about everyone else? I mean, what about the rest of the world? I mean, that's all great for the Christians, but what about everyone else? What would happen in this world if everyone forgot every single religion and everything about every single religion, period? What would happen? Not just your religion, but what would happen in the world? What would be the result of, of this weird occurrence happening? That's, that's what the question is, is trying to ask here. And he says, science is a very abused word. Science means knowledge. Modern science evolved from theistic science, but most of the first scientists believe in God, slowly God was pushed out of science, quote-unquote. So if science without God was forgotten, nothing much would change except for historical science, which is the view of origins. Having a view with God does, not, does nothing to prohibit the research of mutating viruses and other discoveries, so only the view of origins would change if modern science, science without God, was forgotten. I, I think you answered a totally different question. Uh, maybe you're right with the natural language problem, that the word science is being somewhat misused, or you don't understand what he's meaning by science here, or she's meaning by science here. Um, I'm sorry, I said he's meaning because the question came from a guy, and it's a girl holding the sign. I'm, I do apologize. Uh no, I think what he means, and I guess I could be wrong on this, it is a natural language problem. Science as in all science, not knowledge, but the ability to operate machinery and make new things and do the research. So we wouldn't know how to run computers, we wouldn't know how to turn on lights, we wouldn't know how to turn off computers or lights, we wouldn't know how to operate cars or motorcycles or anything else. We wouldn't be able to interface with any technology, period. We wouldn't know how to do research. We would be in a very weird realm. We would be really, really screwed, and it would probably be anarchy, and we probably would never recover from such a position. But uh, your answer is interesting. I don't know that I understand it, but it is interesting and tells us something about your beliefs. So I think I'll let somebody else try to deal with this particular answer. I've said all I can about it. <laughs> His answer for this is after he grew up in a Christian home. Well, okay, fair enough. But why? Are you a creationist? I mean, okay, you grew up in a Christian home. You were, you've been surrounded by this. Is this a doctrine that you're 
church is telling you is the correct way to look at things or understand things? Or is it something that you just think is true? Or is it something that you have found on the internet or something like that? What's the origin of your creationism? The the origin of your disagreement with biological evolution? The origin of your disagreement with the age of the earth? Which, whichever one of those happens to be the case. And or if you're also a geocentrist, what's the origin of that belief? Is it something your parents taught you? Is it something that your pastor taught you? Because I don't see that just reading the Bible straight. I don't get those views. I think that they only come from teaching. And I want to see if that's the case by asking you to your best recollection of where these ideas came from. His answer for this is, it was his plan. So your all-loving God's plan was to kill a million people plus. So instead of just wiping out two people, which is still a bad thing, but to allow people to continue to propagate, fill the earth to about a million people, and kill those million people save a small number of people. So those million people are now in hell. They would have to be in hell because they didn't believe in God. They didn't agree with Noah. They didn't buy into it or they didn't do the right things. That's why they were killed. That was God's plan. God's plan was to allow millions of people to come into existence for the sole purpose of killing those people and letting those millions of souls go to hell. And this is somehow loving. Those lives that they led meant nothing. Th whatever accomplishments they had meant nothing because everything, according to the story, was wiped out. What about the animals? What did they ever do? They didn't do anything. They were innocent in this picture. I guess you want to say, well, the animals were also tainted somehow. They were wiped out along with all the humans. And this was God's loving, perfect plan. I really have a hard time believing that for a second. It doesn't sound like a loving God to me. And it certainly doesn't sound like a very good plan to me. Perhaps you could explain further why God would kill millions of people knowing that they're all going to hell. Why would he do that? It makes zero sense to me. But it still could be true, but you have to give me the reasons why it is true. I just see that as awful and horrible and repugnant. His answer to this is Noah was a preacher of righteousness, Second Peter two five. His guess is that any he invited would come, but none did except for his sons and their wives. And who knows? Neanderthal may have been gene expressed after the flood, so he didn't exist then. Well um okay. <laughs> so Neanderthal existed after Noah, setting Noah way back when, and Noah is now pre-Neanderthal, making Noah before Neanderthal man, which would mean Noah's a primate, uh, a very primitive primate with a very small brain that's not what we would call Homo sapiens today. But okay, sure, why not? We'll go with that answer. Um, I'm not sure that such a primate could preach anything because speech hadn't developed yet before Neanderthal shut up. Speech wasn't a thing yet. So Noah could not have preached anything if your guess is correct and Neanderthal hadn't shown up. But I'm glad that at least you don't deny Neanderthal. That's something that other creationists do deny. They'll deny that Neanderthal is a thing. They'll say, oh, that's not, that doesn't, that's not really a human. That's not important or doesn't count. It's not there. It doesn't, they'll say that it's made up. 
And here again with this guessing that you're doing, you're guessing at the answer rather than looking up what the answer might actually be. His answer to this, to me, is irritating because it displays a ignorance of what the Bible actually says and the translations of the Bible. He says, a better translation would be, thou shalt not murder. No, I'm sorry, you're wrong. It's not a better translation. It's, in fact, the wrong translation. Are you pulling that from the King James? Because I would guess that that's where you're pulling it from. All the earliest translations say kill. They don't say murder, they say kill, because that's the actual word used. The 614 commands weren't murder, I'm sorry, they are murder, and they are killing. No matter how you look at it, it's stoning people to death. Now you're trying to say, well, they're not murder because they're legal commands to kill people. But killing is wrong. You follow that up with saying that these are God's judgments on the sins of the wicked nations, many which practice infant sacrifice. You know how many times God ordered infants to be killed in the Bible, right? You know how ir ironic this statement is. No, these weren't for the wicked nations. These were for the Jewish people. These were who these commandments were for. His chosen people. That's who was to carry out these 600 13 or 14 commandments were the Jewish people. His chosen, loved, cherished people. Not the wicked nations. God didn't care what the wicked nations were doing. He wanted them destroyed. These were the commands that the Jewish people, the chosen ones, had to follow to prove their righteousness. So get your theology straight. It really irritates me as a former Christian when theology is done so sloppily and I, I I I apologize for allowing my my emotions into this mix because I want to remain objective in regards to your answers but it irritates me that your theology is so lacking here and you're probably going to be surprised that a skeptic would tell you to do this read other translations of the Bible that are not the King James Version. If you're wondering why the King James Version is bad, do the research on that. And do the research on what the original language says, what it meant, and so on and so forth. And the best source, by the way, of questions about the Torah, the Old Testament, is rabbis. And I would say go to the more traditional rabbis to get the answers for it. And go to multiple of them. Ask many of them, not just one or two, but like 10 or 20 different rabbis what this word is, what the command is regarding thou shall not kill. And then what the commands of the 614, why, why the stoning to death? What's going on? Isn't this killing? Ask them if there's a conflict. They're probably going to find some way to say that there isn't a conflict, granted. But they're probably going to say, yes, both say killing in the same way. But do that research. I know, I'm telling you to learn more about your religion, but that's kind of my thing. I want you to understand more, not understand less. Okay, back to the hopefully more objective analysis of your answers. I'm responding to your answers, and I'm glad that you gave answers. And again, I apologize for having a little bit of emotion there. His answer to this question is that he believes we're in his image because we have eternal spirits, not for physical reasons. God is a spirit, man has a spirit, animals don't, we're in his image or likeness of God. So I guess any form would do. Uh, our physical body, are you saying that our physical bodies are irrelevant to God? That he doesn't care if they're all screwed up and we can barely use them? Is that what you're saying here? I really need to understand this a little bit better. So it still doesn't really answer the question, why not make us as the, the, the most perfect 
physical being ever on top of also having an internal spirit or whatever. Why not give us the best opportunity to survive? Because the longer we survive, doesn't that mean the more chances that we have to discover God? And the more perfect that we were in contrast to everything else, wouldn't that too somehow point to there being a God rather than us thinking that we're just as flawed as all these other animals so there isn't a God? I mean, I'm just saying that if God wants to prove itself through its creation, that having a sloppy form that isn't very good does nothing to help me think that there is a God. But maybe God doesn't care if I believe in it, I guess. I don't know. But my form is kind of irrelevant to God, I guess is what you're saying. I, I, I'm not sure I'm getting your answer right here. His answer here is we will probably not see new added genetic material. We will only have genetic material switched on and off like the Punnett Square. Though probably if we know that there is no new information as evolution suggests, then we'll understand genetics that much better? Question mark? I... Uh, what? This is so far wrong. <laughs> this is, like, way wrong. I know that it's wrong. This is where I get into problems because my field is logic. That's what I've studied. That's what I've spent my time and energy on. I haven't spent that much time on biological evolution, and I'm, I'm going to get myself a book on it and start reading. But um, I know that this is really wrong stuff, and maybe one of you out there can fix this mess for me because it I know it's wrong. I just can't tell him why it's wrong. Uh, no, this isn't how things work. Please research this stuff for yourself. That's all I can say on this. His answer for this particular question is, if this is what you're asking, I can't explain why there is no God. I take it by faith. Why is there the phenomenon of gravity? Why isn't there not gravity? What could make the law of gravity? The law of gravity is, just as the belief that God is, are both taken by faith, that they were always, although caused by nothing. Well, no, gravity isn't taken on faith, and we, I think, don't know what caused it, although I could be wrong, we might have figured that out by now. So, no, <laughs> the two aren't the same thing. We understand a lot about gravity and how it works, and we have ample evidence of it. As far as God, you're right. God is taken completely on faith. We don't have evidence of it. You have a faith in it. You have a belief in it. I'll grant you that, because you do have that. But that's all you have. You don't have evidence for it. If we did... I wouldn't be skeptical about it. I wouldn't doubt its existence if I had proof that it existed. I don't have proof that it exists. I do have proof of gravity. If I drop something, it falls down. Why there isn't not gravity, I think that that's a fair counter to this question, in all honesty. Because he's asking a question, and you're asking, you're saying, I don't know, but why is there not gravity? It's just, to you, it's the way things are. And that's a fair enough answer. It might be that there is God because there could not be God. Or it might be that there is not God because there couldn't be a God. Either might be true. Or it might just be that there isn't a God because there isn't one, but there's nothing preventing a God from occurring. Or the opposite might be true, that there is a God and that God can never not be because there's something preventing it from not unbecoming. Whichever the case is, I think that this is actually somewhat of a fair answer that you're saying, I think, in essence, to you, from your perspective, that it's a brute fact of reality. One you take on faith, but as far as gravity, that is not taken on faith. And I would implore you to learn and understand the sciences behind gravity and what we know about gravity to understand why it is we don't need faith for gravity, but we do need faith for a god.
So his answer here is that he defines a ton as to pay for. It's just because Jesus paid the price for our sins doesn't mean we don't sin. Right. But why does it still matter? Why does it still exist? It's not about people committing it. He paid the price. It's paid for, right? But that's not good enough. See, what I'm trying to get at, this was my question, by the way. What I'm trying to get at here, maybe I should have had a little bit longer of a question, I suppose, is why does it matter that you have to know that Jesus did this or believe or accept that he did this? I know that there's some theological reasons given, but really think about it. If he really paid, quote unquote, for all sins everywhere, then it shouldn't matter what we think about that act. It should just be, they're paid for, the end. So sin no longer matters. What we believe doesn't matter. Why would it? He's paid for it. It's done. It's taken care of. Why? Uh, oh, you have to accept that gift. Why? It's a gift. It's free. It's there. It's available. You don't even need to know about it for it to still be there and to exist. Oh, but you have to accept it. That's what we're told by most theologians. Why should you have to accept it? It's there. It's just a brute force of reality. He paid for it. How can you screw up if it's already covered? Eh, whatever. Moving on. His answer here is, if he's answering the right question, Adam and Eve didn't have only two sons. The Bible records Cain, Abel, and Seth. Genealogies didn't contain the women's names. It's very safe to say that Seth didn't switch genders. But Adam and Eve had daughters, which weren't recorded because the genealogies uh, didn't usually contain the names of women. In other words, who cares about the women, I guess. So, yeah, okay, I guess. But since the genealogies don't contain the names of the women... We don't know anything about them. So if we were to take a purely literal reading of the scriptures, which is something that many creationists support, we could not know where the women came from because they're not recorded. All of a sudden, later in the Bible, women just show up. And we don't know how that happens because we're never told how that happens. So if we're not allowed to infer anything, and I don't think that a literal interpretation of the Bible allows inference to be made, then you have this unresolvable mystery that you can't answer this question because the Bible doesn't answer it. So maybe, just maybe, we shouldn't look at the Bible literally. And maybe we can make inferences. Well, there must have been women. We don't know who they were, but they must have been there. And if we're going to infer that, then maybe we can infer other things, like the Adam and Eve story isn't literal. It's meant to be maybe a moral story rather than one taken literally. So that's, I think, where this is supposed to be leading you to conclude. But answer for yourself. How can you find out who the wife of Cain was or Seth was? if you don't know who it was. A literal reading would never get you that answer. He says, I believe God exists outside of time or is outside of time. Time is our word and it makes us feel comfortable. Besides that fact, I do know that God created angels. There was a rebellion in heaven. Lucifer and the angels of light or Satan wanted to be like God. God cast him, the other angels that were with him out of heaven they now reside on earth as demons question mark okay um wow uh so existing out of time there's a problem with that but i'm not going to get into that the teaching of the rebellion in in heaven you won't find that in the bible you won't you will find it in the catholic bible maybe but you won't find it in the standardized Bible. And I don't even know you can find it in the Catholic Bible. This seems to be a teaching that was added in. Maybe there's hints of it, but I 
I've I've not seen this really, and I always kind of wondered what was the big deal? Why is it so bad to be like God? I mean, isn't God the best thing to be? Why would be wanting to be like him be such an offense? Who cares? Wouldn't God be like, yeah, that's cool. I'm glad you want to be like me. I'm glad you want to be worshipped. But the fact of the matter is, you can't be me. I can't make you me because I'm not able to do that. And it, as far as worship, I'm the only one that's supposed to get that. I'm the only one worth worthy of that. So I'm very sorry, Lucifer, but you can't get what you want. That's all. Or, or just don't make Lucifer in the first place since you know he's going to rebel. And, you know, why why bring that problem in the first place? Demons on the earth? There's no evidence of that. But again, it's a belief that some people hold. Many have discarded it by, na by now, but it is something that we encounter every now and again. He says, I don't know. A weird kind for sure. They're pretty cool. Only one other mammal lays eggs. So, so that's it? That, it's the kind that lays eggs? It's in the same kind with the other mammal that also lays eggs? It's a weird kind? Uh, this is the problem with the word kind, which is what this question is trying to expose that kind is not a very good way to categorize anything. This is somewhat oddly written. He wrote it as the bonus answer, although that's the next question that's being asked. He says, yes, faith according to Christianity is, as quoted in the book of Hebrews, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence, and he puts in parentheses, logic of existence of things not seen, question mark. And then for my question, he says, yes, question mark. So dealing with that first answer, again, it's a circular argument. You're, you, you're saying that according to your own religion, that faith is the things that you hope for, but that you don't see. That's not tangible. Something you hope for and can't see is not evidence. And then for my question, you say yes, but you don't give me the logical argument. I suppose I should have worded it. What is your logically coherent argument for any of your claims? Or what are they? Or something like that. I want that argument, which you didn't provide. Your answers are answers, and I'm glad that you took the time and energy to answer the questions that we had. Every single atheist, just about, not every single one, a lot of atheists, okay, I'm exaggerating, a lot of atheists answered the 22 questions from creationists. I didn't, because it's it's already done, I have nothing more to add, it's already been said, so... I'm just going to wind up repeating what was already said. Uh, but a lot of skeptics and atheists answered those questions. When I did this project, it was in hopes that we would get just as many theistic responses. We've only gotten two. So I'm glad that somebody is taking their time and energy to answer these questions. Of course, these questions and the answers to them help us to get to understand each other a little bit better. And if you don't mind, I want to take some time to talk directly to uh, Mr. Lee here. And I want to, if, if I can, have somewhat of an open letter here to you. I don't know you as a person. And I know that you're human. I assume that you're male because of your avatar name, but you could be a female for all I know, or you might be a hermaphrodite. I don't know what race you are. I think that that's kind of a arbitrary thing based on skin color. I think we should all just call ourselves the human race. But nonetheless, I, I don't know much about you. I was a Christian. Now I am not. That's all you know about me. And you know I have a YouTube channel, and that, 
that you said that you like some of what I say, even though you disagree with me or something like that, or it makes you think, I think you said that it makes you think, I don't know that you said you like it. Maybe that was somebody else. So I apologize. I don't want to put words in your mouth. I want you to learn. Okay. My goal is not to deconvert you. As surprising as that might be to you. My goal is to encourage you to think critically, ask critical questions. I would rather that you stop denying science and learn about it. Not just believe it because it sounds good or because I told you that it was true. But do the difficult research that's involved in learning this stuff at least to the point where you're like, okay, now I get it. I understand it. And based on the evidence, based on my understanding, I have no further reason to reject these ideas. I would rather you do that and keep believing than remain as you are. If my goal was to deconvert you, I would have a totally different tactic, I suppose. I don't think that that is something that we can do. We can only encourage people to analyze and think and ask tough questions. I, I don't think that we can really deconvert. I don't think we can convert people. People choose these things based on things that they have encountered and uh, agreed with. But nonetheless, I don't care, quote-unquote, if you remain a theist. Fine, remain a theist. Be, believe in God. I, I, it doesn't matter to me. Stop denying science. Stop being anti-scientific. Those are the things that I have a bigger issue with. Because you might think it doesn't really matter in the broad spectrum of things. It's like, who, who cares if I deny biological evolution? What harm does that do? And this is a fair question. Here in America, and maybe you don't live in America, but here in America, we are the second from the bottom of a list of nations who disagree with biological evolution. That's pretty sad. We shouldn't be there. We should be the number one on the list of agreement with biological evolution. We shouldn't have this problem, but we do. And there's a National Center uh, for Science uh, video or two or three videos that they have that really cover this stuff really well, and you'll learn a ton from that. You will learn so much from scientific videos and science in general. And it is amazing. It is beautiful and wonderful. Sometimes it's ugly. Don't get me wrong. But it is always interesting, at least to me. And if you want to believe that ultimately God is behind all of that, fine. But let go of this doctrine, because this doctrine is a false teaching. And I don't want to sound too much like a pastor or a preacher or a minister, but don't get me started, because, well, you know, look, this is a false teaching that somebody is teaching. And I don't know why it caught on and why it's still a thing, but it's stupid and wrong, and it is causing nothing but a stumbling block. It is one more reason to reject the idea of Christianity. If all Christians everywhere, globally, had zero problems with science, we would have one less thing to complain about. Videos like this wouldn't exist. The Creationist Museum would not exist. What we would have, in, maybe in its place, is how about a museum of the real history of your own religion? The details, here's what we do know. Here's where this archaeological dig was and what they found. Here's the real evidence of it. It turns out Nazareth wasn't really a city like we thought it was. So what does that mean? Here's what we think it means, but this is opinion, and 
make sure that we have it bolded opinion ver and we have maybe different plaques like a silver plaque for facts and a, a bronze plaque for opinion or something like this. I'm just creating stuff off the top of my head of what I would want to see. But at any rate, my point is, look, don't just buy into anti-evolution, anti-age of the earth. Don't just say, well, I don't think that it's true or I don't... I don't know. It seems like they're using bad science. Why not investigate it? Learn about it. Pick up some books about it. Do some research online. And I always suggest books first, even though finding books is harder than... It, it, that is the reason I suggest books, because it is harder. Research online, it's too easy to find fake stuff online and not even know that you found something fake. But go to the real science sites, so NASA for space, you know, uh, National Science Association, National Center for Science Association website, places like that where you know that it's accredited, you know that it's real science, and you know you're not going to get bull from them, okay? And if you still have questions, a lot of those places will let you email them and ask the questions. And they'll be like, here, it's right here, it's here, it's here, it's here. Here's the answer, here's the answer. I have learned a lot about science. Surprisingly, because creationists are out there and the skeptics are making videos against them and having to explain the real science. So I listen to those videos. I'm amused that the creationists are getting it wrong. And then I learn something about the real science in the process. I can't do that because my, my, my knowledge is logic. All I can tell you is you don't have a logically coherent argument. You don't have logically coherent ideas. Your ideas do not match with reality. If you encountered somebody that said the earth is flat, you would tell them that they're wrong, I hope, right? No matter what they said, well, but it says in my book that, that the world is flat, or at least I think it says that, you would say, look, it's wrong. It's, it's not flat. It's this fear. Oh, well... I just don't believe that. Well, uh, learn about it. See if it is. Nah, I don't want to. I'd rather believe what I think is true than find out what is true. It won't hurt your belief in God. And if it does, then perhaps the next courageous step to make is to question that which you hold most dear, which is right now God. I don't think that agreeing with science and finding out and learning more about it and understanding it will harm your belief. It didn't for me, but every, every human is different. But fear should not hold you back. If you really want to know what the truth is, be courageous in the pursuit of that truth. And find out for yourself what is true. Rather than being a stumbling block for people like me, engage your intellect and learn about the truth about science. And so you will then remove that stumbling block. And granted, there will be other issues that I have. But... Before you can get to those issues, you must remove this issue. And unless and until you do, you will continue to create a stumbling block for me and others. Something that your own religion tells you not to do. Unless and until you remove these stumbling blocks, I will continue to be skeptical that you even care about your own religion.